unpack what the judgment looks like. Then what we're going to do is, based on that information, we're going to look at the operation of the judgment, logically. And what we're going to see is that God is not the one that we're to be afraid of. I'll go to you. Then what I'll do, uh, when I get to uh, session six, I will unpack that, and I'll show you from the spirit of prophecy uh, how the operation of the judgment works. And it will blow your mind to see how gracious is our God. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a fear factor, and most will be lost. But we're going to find that the bullet will not come from God's gun. Mm -hmm. It be very interesting when we unpack this thing, what we're going to find. <clears throat> the other thing, and then, and then what will happen is after this one, okay, after the judgment, after this one, is the setup for my session, for the session five. And what that is, we're going to look at how the sanctuary explains the reason for the delay in the second coming. And now that we've been going through this, you don't realize it, but you're getting primed. So that when we hit it, the light bulb's going to go on, and you're going to stand, you're going to understand the issues right now in Adventism that are real heated in Adventism. You're going to instantly go, now I understand. <laughs> that makes sense. And, and all you have to do is understand the operation of the judgment on earth to understand what's going on up there. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's why God did it to us. So let's begin with a word of prayer. And, uh, and, 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 if, and if you can, uh, join me. Cause, cause I need Dear Father, we are grateful really for these golden moments that you are giving to us. And uh, Father, we're about to now uh, begin the plunge now into some very deep issues. And, and Lord, I am not up to the task at all. I am so grateful, Father, for the things that you have taught me. But Lord, you know what a forgetful creature I am. You know every defect of my character. And so I'm praying, dear God, for the, your sake, for the sake of your precious lambs in this room, that you will hide me and that Jesus will be seen. I am willing, Lord, to be used by you as a conduit by which you can communicate your will and way. So I pray, Father, you give me the right words, you give me the right expression, the right love, that you will not be misrepresented in any way. So please guard and, uh, your own honor and name here, Father. Fill us with your presence. Keep me humble, Lord, and under your direction and power is my prayer. But I pray for your bright, shining angels now to press here. I ask, Lord, that you will present a ring of fire of those angels to surround this room. The Prince of Darkness will not be allowed, Lord, entry to annoy nor to distract. Now, Lord, it is to you that we pray. We thank you for this and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> When we think about the sacrifice that God made to save you, the child of God, it should be the clearest indicator that God is serious about sin. No games. Sin is destructive. It destroys the people God loves. God plays no games with sins. He does not negotiate with it. It is cancer of the worst kind and it has to be eradicated. And so, Jesus' mission, in, in Matthew one twenty one, it says, talking about Jesus, that he will save his people from, not in, their sin. From their sin, not in their sin. This is very important, and we'll continue to unpack this. He came to save them from their sin. And so the focus of Jesus' mission is to save man from their sin. And the theme of the sanctuary is to explain how he does it. To unpack this thing. In the end, sadly, there will be those who will lose out on eternal life. There will be those who did not cooperate with Jesus. Either didn't want to or didn't care to. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Very, very Im important. And so what we're going to do is we're going to now start to unpack a little deeper this glorious work that God wants to do. Because it's all about living above the power of sin. Do you realize that? You see, the sanctuary in the outer court, in the death, remember we talked about the death of Jesus and then the dedication? When you give your life to Christ, what service follows it? 
his baptism. So Jesus, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we then enter into the water experience. In the path, remember we talked about the east and the west, and this is the path that leads to the throne of God? So as the sinner comes, he first goes to the cross. He enters into the watery grave experience, right? This shows us how to become a Christian. The outer court teaches us how to become a Christian. But the holy place teaches us how to remain one. Are you with me? Out here, we learn about justification. Here, we're going to learn about sanctification. There, there, I'm hearing some goofy things out there that you can't experience sanctification without justification. It's not possible. And I'm hearing people that, well, you can experience justification, but not sanctification. It's not possible. Because all sanctification is, is the verb. It's the action of justification. If justification has been experienced, you're going to be experiencing sanctification. In other words, they are the two sides of one coin. They're two different things, but they're the two sides of one coin. So if you have given your life to Jesus Christ and dedicated your life to him, it's going to show in your life. Are you with me? And so here we learn to walk. And this is glorification when God takes us home and, all is, and, 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 and death and the, the sin is gone. So you have justification, sanctification, glorification. How to become a Christian, how to remain a Christian, going home with Christ. Mm. Are you with me? Yeah. So the sanctuary reveals it to us. All right. So here's the, here's the now, now for those of you who have the session, I'm looking at session three. The session three. I thought somebody was knocking. What is God's will concerning his people? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4 says, For this is the will of God, your what? Sanctification. Your sanctification. That you should abstain in, from sexual immorality, it's from sin, period. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and what? Honor. And in honor. And so what happens here, sanctification is a dedication for holy use, is to be sanctified. It's a change in the life. So before I, this is my heart, before I give my life to Jesus, um, there is a throne in all of our hearts. Okay? And from that throne, we're calling the shots. And, and so in my heart, I decide what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it. But when I ask Jesus into my life, Jesus takes that throne. Amen. But it's not by force. I have to surrender to him. What does that mean? That means that when you ask Jesus, you begin studying the Word of God, and you, and you spend time with God in prayer, God starts making you sensitive to righteousness and evil. And as God, as you, uh, let's say your spouse says something that in the past you would go off on, and as you turn to go off, the Holy Spirit warns you, don't say it. Now you have a choice to make. Leave Jesus on the throne and remain silent, or tear him off the throne and take over. Are you with me? Yeah. So each of us have a choice. When we ask God into our hearts, Jesus comes. And by the way, he begins a cleaning up process. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that he does? Jesus is in a cleaning business. And you know, he's in the sanctuary, cleansing the sanctuary in heaven. He sends his Holy Spirit that while he's cleansing your record up there, he sends the Holy Spirit to cleanse your life. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. I am so glad. And so when he sets up shop, he begins a tiny process. Blessed be the name of the Lord, because I need it. Take a look right here, a little note. I have a little definition for us of sanctification. Sanctification is total right, blessing. It is surrender of our will to the will of God. It is something God does in the repentant sinner who cooperates with God. Bible sanctification is motivated and empowered all the way by the Holy Spirit and directed to the honor and glory of God. Without his power working in us, we are totally helpless and hopeless. Jesus said, without me you can do how much? Amen. You know the problem that you and I have? We say amen, and we really don't believe it to the core. Mm -hmm. We are so incredibly independent. God wants us independent from one another, but not independent from him. And, and so what happens is that God has to let us fall flat on our face before we'll finally realize how helpless we are. Ellen White says that God has to humble us in the dust. By the way, we really don't need help. We do pretty well on our own. We can mess things up faster than anything. And so God sadly sometimes, he doesn't want those experiences for us, but there comes a point that we just won't learn any other way. 
So he has to step back and let things run their course before we'll understand that I cannot, that he can. It is God who transforms the believer in all aspects of his daily existence, in his thinking, in his acting, desire, in short, completely. This effect is seen in the home, the work, the school, church, and in the community at large. I'm going to share with you one of my pet peeves. Please don't be offended. If you've ever said this or done this, don't tell me, don't confess. <laughs> but when I hear, you've heard this said, God accepts me the way I am. My friends, it's not true. I'm sorry. He doesn't. God will receive you the way you are. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. Are you with me? God does not accept us the way we are. He can't. But he will receive us. Look at it this way. It's like a shower. The shower will receive you. <laughs> the way you are. But it will not leave you that way. It's going to clean you up. And, and, and that's how it is. You know, there was a time in my life, my life was really messed up. Uh, I share with you how my father was atheist, my mother was Catholic, and early on, and then she accepted the message. And I grew up in a very mixed up world, and then I grew up with a brand of Adventism that was nominal uh, at best. It's what I saw. Uh, not in my Spanish church, interestingly enough, but in other areas. But I, it was a nominal Adventism. It was powerless. And Can you explain that word so we can, so for those It was in vain. In vain. It was a power. Well, we can unpack a power. Okay. We'll unpack it because Paul talks about the, uh, the Christianity in the last days that's formed in the power. Mm -hmm. And um, and so when I, my life was really messed up, and I, and I shared with you how, how uh, at uh, 19 I decided life wasn't worth living and I was going to end my life. And in the process, God stepped into my world. It was incredible. I w I'd love to share that story when I have time. But uh, I made a decision then to start following the Lord. And, and one of the things that I, that I had to do is I had to clean up my life. And, uh, and I couldn't. I tried really hard. And there came to a place one day, I went to my knees, and I said, if you want me, you're going to have to clean me up. He said, I can't. Mm -hmm. And he did. Mm -hmm. He did. He did clean me up. God does not accept me. He loves me too much to accept me the way I am. Mm -hmm. He has much better than mm -hmm. He will receive me. But then he begins a process of cleaning up. Mm -hmm. Number two, in order to enjoy sanctification, what attitude must one have towards Jesus and sin? 1 John 3.3 3 says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Okay? Exodus 33.13 says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, <clears throat> show me now the way that I may know you and that I may find grace. And so what this is finding is a person who wants the sanctification experience has to have a teachable spirit. It has to be somebody who's willing to be wrong. Do you like to be pointed out when you're wrong? Do no, you like your stuff pointed out? That's got to change. It's got to change. You know how many of us have prayed, Lord, show me what's wrong in my life. And how happy we would be if... Somebody's at the door, and we open it, and there was this glorious angel with a clipboard. <laughs> this is the stuff that's going on in your life. You've got to correct this, and this, and this, and this is how we're going to do it. We would love it, because we're proud. But let your spouse come and tell you. <laughs> let your child come and tell you. Listen, friends, when God begins the process, that's who's going to work. It's only a humble heart that will respond. I have to pray that God gives me that heart, because I'm a proud man. And ask God, Lord, please humble me under your hand. And hang on. That's not a fun experience. But ask him, because there's no other choice if we plan to be saved. Help me, Jesus. And, and you know, so funny. Um, there was a time in my life when I was beginning my walk. And I asked, I was beginning to understand the sanctuary. And, and this whole idea of God plans to do was sin. And I said, well, Lord, then show me the sins of my life. And I was watching a football game. I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I have my readings. You want to come talk, uh, talk to me? I don't anymore. I was watching a football game. And it was one Sunday morning, and my wife walked into the room, and she walked up to me, and she stuck her finger right in my face. Mm -hmm. She said, I need you to be a priest in this house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't have children at the time. She walked off down the hallway. 
And I was one way. There had to be no argument. I was minding my own business. I was enjoying the game. I was peaceful, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what happened, you know. And, and I, I was like, Lord, you saw that. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't know what to do. So, I grabbed my Bible and I went outside because I figured, I mean, it's not injury. I went to a walk with the Lord and as I'm walking, I said, I better take this with me. And I went out there and I was saying, Lord, what in the world was that? Why did she say that to me? And then I got to thinking, what does it mean to be the priest of your home? I've heard people throw that word around so much. Mm -hmm. But I, I really stopped to analyze it. I really didn't know what it meant. And I was new in my walk. I read the whole thing in my Bible, and I thought to myself, is it possible that this book can teach me how to be a better father? I mean, well, at the time, a husband, but to teach me to be a father. We didn't have children in the world. But could this book teach me how to be a better husband? And so I began to uh, search in the Bible. This is a pathetic story, but it's an honest story. And, and I looked everywhere and talked about husbands, you know, and what they're supposed to do. And I came across this text. Turn with me, your Bibles, to Ephesians. This is a pathetic, we're being, I'm being honest. I don't, no games, I don't pull punches, this is reality. Okay? And let's take a look at Ephesians chapter uh, 5. And as I'm looking through, reading everything that the God has to say about a husband, I figure if I do that, I must be the my home. And I came across this chat text in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And I thought, bingo. There's the problem. If my wife would only do what I told her to do, <laughs> then this, oh, this thing would work out. I mean, that's what it says. <laughs> And so, like a young Toto, <laughs> I sought out my wife with the word. And I showed her the text. Imagine my surprise when my wife now didn't even want to talk to me. Wouldn't cooperate with me. Are you with me? And now I thought she's in total rebellion. <laughs> the word says this. There was a man in my church who was a, a godly grandfather. A very godly man who taught me a lot about Jesus. I didn't know what to talk to. I thought, this is, I, I, I got a bad situation here. And so I called him. I said, uh, I said, Dan, we've got to talk. And he said, okay, maybe at the church. And I shared with him my very sad story. And I was waiting for him to turn, you know, to put his arm around me and, and give me some comfort. And he said to me, he says, uh, George, very calm, very kind. He says, I don't think your wife is the one to call me. He said, George, let me ask you a question. Now follow this. He said, George, hello, come on in. Okay, good. We got you covered there. Yeah, sorry. Do you have a paper? Do you need one? No, I think we're out here. You're married, that's true. You're one. <laughs> I said, uh, he said, he said, George, I said, so he says to me, your wife's not the one. I don't think your wife's in the problem. He said, George, let me ask you a question. If your wife was married to Jesus, would she submit to him? And I thought about Jesus and what he's like, and I said, you know, I think so. He said, that's your problem. You're not like Jesus. <laughs> it was at that moment that it dawned on me that the transforming work that God wants to do in our lives is not a wish upon a star, hopeful, Let's see how close we can get there. God's intention is to reproduce his character mm -hmm. in each of us. It was at that moment, I was like thunderstruck. It dawned on me. As many times I heard it, I realized this is God's goal for me and for you. No games. This is what God's after. He wants to reproduce his life. He said to me, now George, look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, he said, George, that day that your wife stuck her finger in your face, I would venture to guess she didn't even know what she was doing. It was the Holy Spirit. Later I asked her. She didn't even know what she said. I don't even know where that came from. And I asked her, what does it mean then to be a priest of her own? She says, I really don't know what that means. When God begins to work in your life and starts pouring stuff out, he's 
not going to bring an angel. He's going to bring people close to you. And if we're not listening, we're going to shut the door on God. We have to have a heart and mind that is willing, a teachable spirit that says, I am capable of anything. And so we say, Lord, is it true? Show me. And he will. So it's coming to the Lord. It's having a teachable spirit. You know, it's amazing to me. Well, let me, let me go on from there. Number, uh, number three. So then how is this work accomplished? How does God reproduce his character in you and me? Isn't that the question of the hour? How does he do it? <clears throat> in John 3, 15, verse 4 and 6, 4, 4 through 6, we find the answer. It's so simple that it's, that it's, it's hard for a proud person to grasp. <clears throat> Abide. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it what? Abides in the vine. Neither can you, my child, unless you what? Abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who what? Abides in me, and I in him bears much what? Fruit. fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are what? The key is an abiding relationship with Jesus. This is one thing, and I, I haven't done this yet, but I want to do a study on this whole idea of connection. I can show you a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, that Adam and Eve, what kept them from sinning, even though they had a fall, a, a unfallen nature, was their connection with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I can show you that point. That when I saw that, this whole argument about the nature of Christ thing goes out the window. It doesn't matter what nature you have. Your only hope is to be connected to to, to God, to the Holy Spirit. Are, are you with me? Mm -hmm. But there is an important issue on the nature of Christ, and I don't know if I'll bring that in, but I'll, I will touch on it because it's very important to us. But in any thing, in any case, my point is victory comes to the connection with Jesus. Alright. Now, it talked about fruit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit, not you and not me. That's His fruit. But it happens when we're connected. Now, I grew up in the city, and for me, food came from the store. <laughs> that's where food came from for me. Uh, there was a strange revelation later, but that's where it came from for me. Um, so, so some of you might be challenged with my illustration, but stay with me. Here is a grapevine, all right? And you can see there's fruit here, grapes. If you walked into a grapevine in the cool morning hours, where it was quiet, and you listen carefully to the grapes, let me tell you what you will not hear. Grape! Grape! <laughs> You're not going to hear that. Grapes are a byproduct It's a byproduct of being connected. The connection is the key. It's coming to Jesus. The connection is what takes... Open your Bibles. Let's take a look at Paul talking about the connection. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Here's the con he's going to explain the connection and how the process works. And by the way, when we study this, we're going to instantly understand the devil's program. Instant. Number 18. But we all, are you there? Mm -hmm. Revelation 3, 18. Mm -hmm. But we all with, uh, if, if you're not there, say, mercy. I'll wait for you. I need you there. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. You know, people always say, amen. We need something for the other side. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Let's stop right there. Mirror, mirror, mirror. We talk about mirror in the Bible. James uses the illustration of the mirror to describe what? Amen. The law of God. What's the law? It is a transcript of the character of God. When you're looking at the law, you're not just looking at do's and don'ts. God is introducing himself to you. 
But we all with unveiled veils, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? His character. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we are studying the Word of God, as we're studying the Bible to know God better, in the whole time we're doing it, He's transforming us, and we don't even know. The process is imperceptible, Ellen White says. But as we're looking, and the thing is, here's the thing, a person cannot rise above his concept of God. During the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church taught that you were going to burn in hell forever. That's how God treats his enemies. How did the church treat its enemies? It burned them. So whatever your concept of God is, that's how far you're going to rise. But when you study the life of Jesus and find that he's loving and kind to sin, what are you going to be? Yes. Are, are you with me? Yes. When you study the life of Christ, a transformation begins to take place within the life. Now, what, what Paul is introducing us to here is a natural law. What's this law? Gravity. I don't believe in gravity. That's crazy. Yeah. Did gravity care about what I believe? <laughs> <laughs> there is a law in operation in the mind. Whether you and I believe it or not is irrelevant. It is still working. Amen. And in the last Amen. days, there, a battle is on between Christ and Satan to get your attention. Why? Because whoever has your attention has your mind and will transform you. Amen. And so Satan owns the media industry. Amen. And he is saying, by the old day, you will become changed. Amen. And so what's happening in the world is an acceleration in the process of character development between Christ and Satan. Yep. And listen, my friends, I don't have time for this. This is from Phil. If you have a chance, bring me in. Pastor Carl Tesalabasides to help you understand the issue of music. A lot of people think it's the lyrics. It is not the lyrics. But what's more powerful than the lyrics is the style. The music style is far more powerful than is the lyrics. By far. Not true. Oh, it isn't. When you have a romantic evening, are you going to play marching band music? <laughs> no. Because the music communicates it communicates a message. So the style, and so what the devil has done, and the Bible says my people are destroyed for what? We had better figure this thing out, and we better figure it out fast. This is a serious issue. The things we watch, the things we listen to, the things we read are all having an effect upon our character. And if we want to be like Jesus, we better spend time with it. Solomon said it best, but as a man thinketh in his heart, what is, what is controlling our thoughts and our minds when we are becoming like right. So if we're, if we're really serious about this transformation issue, we're going to engage this battle. So I don't want anybody touching my music. You have an idol. Mm. Oh, and wow. you love it more than Jesus Christ. Mm. Let's get it over with. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's, the, that's the deal. That's the deal. That's the deal. But we gotta look to that cross and to the one who bled and died. Yes. Are you with me? Now listen. There ain't anybody in this room, I, I doubt, that struggle with that more than I do. Mm -hmm. I, I hated hymn music. Mm -hmm. I hated it. Mm -hmm. I used to go into the bathroom when I first started going to church. When he started singing, I plugged my ears. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding you. But you know what? Today, what I used to love, I now hate. Mm -hmm. And what I used to hate, I now love. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is you and I are struggling with, Jesus can do it for you. Mm -hmm. He can do it for you, and he can do that for me. Now, I want to share something with you, a simple illustration. Okay, flashlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the key is in the connection, right? I'm going to turn this out for a moment, so those in camera land, stay with me. <laughs> I want you to pretend that that's dark, right? I can't. But if that, what would be in here if there was no light coming through? I don't want this anymore. Go ahead and turn it off and just hang it right here. And, and I want to change. So I go to my friends and I share them my problem and they say to me, you gotta stop doing that. Okay. You gotta get rid of that darkness. Oh, okay. I guess I'm not like everyone else. I guess I was just born for the 
fires in heaven. Mm -hmm. But I have a friend named Chris, and Chris, go ahead and shine that at me. So Chris is shining, and I said, Chris, what do I, what do, I do? And Chris says, you gotta turn to the right. So I turn, and suddenly I look, and I say, wow, a lot of those shadows are gone, but there's still some in there, what do I do? Closer. You see, as I as I make the decision every day to come to Jesus and yield my life, He deals with the darkness mm -hmm. in my life. You know, I used to think that God worked in me to rip sin out of my life. That's not what He does. What God does is He works with me and brings me to a place to see sin for what it really is. And other white says, we bob it. The soul expels it. Mm -hmm. You begin to see it. I remember a guy who was a missionary. He was overseas. And uh, he was in India. He was there for a long time. He didn't meet with much success. His uh, wife, things weren't going well. She went back home. He got really discouraged. And, uh, and one day, he was, he was, his thoughts were dark. He had been on this track for some time. We talked about the process of the denial. Mm -hmm. And he's walking along this path that was next to a river. And out in the water, he saw a little baby. And she was in And you could see the sun glimmering there on her and, and in the water. And, and at the moment, he gave in to passion. He ran in the water. And he grabbed that woman and spun her around. And she had leprosy. Mm -hmm. He lost interest real fast. You see, what God does is he, that thing that we love, we're deceived. We don't see it for what it is. But as we come to know Jesus better and we spend more time with this, he brings us to the place that we see it. And we are repulsed. Are you with me? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Without Christ, you and I cannot distinguish right. So if you want your life to change and you don't have a devotional life, because Jesus changes us as we spend time. So, through what medium is this abiding change wrought? It is through the daily experience. My work in cooperating with Jesus is to meet with him each day and to submit to his work and leading in my life. How? By confessing and turning from sin. By calling sin by its right name. If I do not call what I'm doing sin, God can't touch it. And we're really good. We Adventists will slap a soybean on anything. <laughs> we don't do that. We, I, I've seen soy crab meat in the store. Listen, this thing is dangerous. We're coming, we're coming as close to sin as we can. Yes. And I have learned that if you want to get away from sin, you better get as far away. I don't care that it is made of soy. I will buy it. Because it makes the next step that easy. It makes it that easy. Get as far away. I remember sitting with a fellow who... Uh, Next to me. He, I was a new Christian. He was a prominent member in the church. And we went out to eat in a social, and we're eating, and I was looking at his soup. And I, I wasn't always a vegetarian. I mean, I ate anything that crawled across my plate, to be honest. <laughs> and I looked over at his dish, and I saw stuff floating in there that I know was me. And it surprised me, because I know I've been as a vegetarian, and when I thought about this guy's position in the church, I thought, surely it's not. And so I grabbed the menu. I wanted to take a look. Dear friend, it was not only me. It was pork. Oh. And I looked over at it, and I didn't want to call him out in front of people. You know, God doesn't call us to do that. Mm -hmm. You want to get called out? Don't call anybody else out. <laughs> and so I leaned over to him, and I said, my brother, there's pork in your dish. He looked down, and he says, he says, yeah, but there's soybeans in there. <laughs> what? <laughs> that was his response. And it's really interesting. We sit here in shock, but we do that. <laughs> If somebody else does it, it's sin, but if I do it, I have an excuse. Whether it's forgiveness, right? Or maybe our taxes, right? We have a way of justifying evil. For God to be able to work in our lives, we have to call sin by its right name. For God to be able to access it. What's the other thing? The second is a daily commitment, and we learn that in the, in the labor of water. We learn every day we recommit our lives to Jesus. Then we learn obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness. We ask Him in our lives, and He's also the power for us to witness. Then we study the Word of God. And I just want to take a moment. Do you know the power that is in this book? Mm. Do 
you have any idea? Somebody said 30 minutes, we're going. Okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sweetie. But you know, do you know the power? Let me tell you how much power is in this book. In the beginning. You hold a grain of sand and you hold it up against the night sky and that part of the sky hides thousands of galaxies each with over 200 billion stars. Mm -hmm. And all he did, this is called the word. The word that created everything, that power is here. It is here. That power to create is in here to recreate. The Sabbath is the evidence, it is the down payment that God can bring light out of the darkness of their life. Amen. He who said, let there be light, and there was light, can do that. The Sabbath is a reminder that he is not only my redeemer, he's my creator and recreator. Amen. And so when I open this book, I am accessing the power that brought everything into the world. You with me? Yeah. It is, it, we, we, there's no, listen, you get an atom and you split it. What atom? And, and what do you get? You get, you get an explosion. What atom? How many atoms are, are this high mm -hmm. in the universe? And you, it all spoke it into existence. So when we spend time with God, God is diffusing that power in our life. Are you with me? And when we reveal sin in our life, we yield to him. We say, Lord, give me the victory. I'm going forward. I'm trusting you to give me the to do it. To do it every day. But the key is to remain what? Connected. With God, and the fifth is committing, is communing with God in prayer. And so, what we're finding is that the devotional life is absolutely critical. How many of you are morning people? You're morning folks. Listen, you could be a morning person all your life. The day you decide to have a devotional, yeah. it's it's awesome. Awesome. oh, <laughs> see, the devil doesn't care that you go to church on Saturday. He doesn't care. You listen, the people that crucified Christ. We're preaching, we're waiting for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They went to church on Saturday. They had the health message mm -hmm. and they taught. They were good at this. Mm -hmm. And they crucified the King of Glory. Because mm -hmm. they didn't know him. And the only way to know him is to spend time with him. Mm -hmm. right. That's the only way is by spending time with him. So the devil, the moment the devil sees you having devotions, now he's nervous. Mm -hmm. See, you're very we're very effective. If we don't spend time with Jesus, and so we go to church, and what calls that? We become a decoy for Satan. Mm -hmm. The biggest reason why youth are leaving the church is they see no power. Mm -hmm. There's no power. They're just playing church. Because they're not connecting with the power source that transforms the life. It's about change. It's about, it's about, it is what it's about. So the battle begins when we have a devotional life. Number five, where does the power to obey come from? Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will, that's your desire, and to do for his good pleasure. It is the, he, he, you don't have the desire, go to Jesus and ask him for the desire. Pray for it, dear God help me, and spend time with him. And he'll begin that process. You know, when I was, uh, when I first came in my life to the Lord, one of the many problems I have is I have foul mouth. Uh, every time I opened my mouth, it was four letter words, filled and foul, filled and foul. And one day as I began my walk with Jesus, I was reading my Bible, I read where it said that no corrupt communication Escape your lips. Well, my language is corrupt. And I said, by the way, he showed me later that joking, jokes were too. Okay? And so as I looked at that, I said, well, Lord, okay, if that's what you want, then I will quit. <laughs> and so that, that was it. Uh, that was, in fact, it was around New Year's, so that was my New Year's resolution. Uh, the second year, it was my New Year's resolution again. <laughs> <laughs> that I was going to quit. I intended to. I was very sincere. I wanted it. But I couldn't stop. And my devotions were kind of sporadic. By the way, sporadic devotions, sporadic victory. Wow. And, and so, ooh, as I went to the Lord, um, one day finally I went to my knees. And I just looked at my heart and I said, I know you want that in me, and I am so failing. I said, God, I'm giving you permission. If you want this out of my life, you're going to have to get it out of my life. So whatever it takes, I'm giving you permission. Let it be written in the books of heaven. Let the arm of the universe see. I'm giving you permission to do whatever it takes to get out of here. <coughs> and 
you know, months passed, and I had a friend, his, his name was Audrey, precious, I love this man, I pray for him every day, but he didn't serve the Lord, he's the only person I knew that was worth about that I did. <laughs> and he called me on the phone, I hadn't heard from him a long time, and we got on the phone, usually when we got together, it got real colorful. And, but he was on the phone, and I kept pulling the phone, and I'm like, yeah, that's, it. that's amazing. Oh, I couldn't stand it. And I hung up the phone, and I realized I didn't say any bad words. Hmm. Which, that was amazing, talking with him. And then I looked back, and I thought, hey, when did it stop? When did it stop? Mm. Now, don't get me wrong, there was a battle before the stoppage. Mm. And it was, a, it was a battle that took a year and a half, but the victory was given to me. Mm. You know, you can scare me now. <laughs> <laughs> I can drop something on my foot. Wow. No problem. Praise the Lord. But there was a day. People used to tell me, I know what your last words are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I pray that those last words have to be Jesus. Amen. And nothing else. But that's not an issue. God did that for me in my life. And there's so many other things I can share with you. But here's the thing. Now I'm going to tackle this issue about sin. We're going to keep saying after the second coming. There will be people that will do that. And they'll be lost. Either Jesus can set me free or he can. The Bible, my Bible tells me you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says, I am the truth. This is what Christ does. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't stand before you as sinless. I'm in a process. Are you with me? But what I used to love, I now hate. And what I used to hate, I now love. And I remember, this is the only time I ever did this, I was uh, talking to a JW. Maybe I should have said that. Mm. But anyway, I did. He was very sincere. And I was, I was in a used car lot, and I was going to buy a vehicle. And he comes up to me, and we were asking questions. And, uh, and, he was, and I noticed he was very religious. So as we kept talking, I began to witness to this guy. To, I began to witness to the witness. And, uh, and as I did, this brother had experience. Because all of a sudden, he zeroed in right away off the set of the evidence. And I don't know how he, he, he picked that up so fast. It was amazing. <laughs> and he says to me, you know, uh, the one thing about the set of the evidence I just, I, just can't, I just can't handle is that uh, I don't believe that God's Ten Commandments can be obeyed. Now, I didn't have much time. I had my wife and kids waiting in the car. I had to leave right away. What would you have said? So this is what I did, and I've never done this to anyone, not even my wife, to anyone. But I turned to that brother, and I opened up to him the dark chapters of my life. Mm -hmm. I shared with him the things that had me bound, one sin, one lies after another. When I was done, I said to him, none of that is part of my life anymore. Mm -hmm. None of it. I don't like knuckling. I don't think about it. I don't sweat it. I don't miss it. That's my question. Which is the sin? Because what we're actually saying, it's actually an indictment against God. We're telling you, you're just not strong. Mm -hmm. the devil is. No, friends. The reality is that God's in a process to set us free. And it's a process. You can't do it all at once because you and I couldn't handle it. But it is in proportion. It is in proportion to the time we spend with Jesus. Yes. Amen. It is in proportion to that time. Can you imagine if we spent even half the time with Jesus that we do with Facebook, what kind of Christians would we be today? <laughs> 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 Amen. 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 Number six. So how does God do this? Watch this. Watch this beauty. How does he do it? Remember we stood the connection, right? Yeah. Spending with time, beholding him. Watch this. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. Old Testament, look at the new covenant in the Old Testament. Amen. Now, every time the word I appears, I want you all to speak. And that's the first word. So, I. That's God speaking. We'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Go ahead. I. We'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I. We'll put my spirit within you, and look at this, and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And now look at the new covenant, Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. And it's as we're spending time with Jesus, by beholding we become changed. Look at the note. Ellen White, this is the most amazing quote. 
Ellen White, 668. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was hard work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims so blend our hearts and minds to the conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Mm -hmm. We won't even be aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why when he turns to the sheep and he says, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, and he said, The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ. Through communion with God, sin will become faithful. So whatever it is that has you bound today, go to Jesus and say, set me free and keep coming. The rich young ruler walked away. Mm -hmm. Seven. When united to Jesus, what is our duty? Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. There's the mind of the sanctuary. Set your affections, affections on things above and not on the things on the earth. Right now we've got that reverse. Mm -hmm. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What a beautiful Savior. Number eight. Sadly, Paul warned that in the last days, much of the Christianity will become like the world. Second mm -hmm. Timothy 3, 1, 5. But know this. That in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Slanderers. Without self-control. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying his power. But such people turn away. And the sad reality is, when Paul was saying this, he wasn't talking about the world, he was talking about the church. The church becomes like the world. Look, if I dress like the world and do the, and do the things of the world, and I think the thoughts of the world, and involve the activities of the world, I don't care that, I, that the person shows up on Sabbath of the world. It's that simple. If there isn't a difference between you and me and you're in the world and I'm not, why is the world going to be interested in what I have? You know, when I was, uh, I was, uh, I had to do uh, a wedding for my cousin. A precious uh, lady, she is, uh, she's really, she doesn't go to church. She's one of the Catholics that go to church twice a year. You know what I'm talking about. She's not even a not even a devout Catholic. And, uh, and her husband was Hindu who now is nothing. He doesn't believe in any of it, in anything. He's very secular. And so they're equally yoked. They're both lost. And so I was asked to do the wedding, and they're equally yoked. It's okay for an Adventist pastor to do it. As long as they're equally yoked, it's all right. They're equally yoked. But I saw an opportunity to try to witness to them. So I was out there doing the, the, the stuff with them. And, my, um, and, I, and I went, his name was John. And as I was talking to John, I, I tried to witness to him, and he put the brakes on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really not interested, thank you. And I thought, hmm. So I thought, Lord, how can I reach this kid? <laughs> and, uh, and then, as we're going along, we picked up my, my niece's husband. He's sitting in the back seat. And he starts asking the questions. So why do you believe what you believe? And I went, <laughs> John was driving. He's stuck. <laughs> he's got to listen. So I'm answering the questions when I'm talking to John. And I was trying to tailor it to him. You know, I just kept talking throughout the weekend. On the very last day, when the service was over at the wedding, he was going to take him back to the airport. And, and oh, by the way, it was Friday, and they were having a gathering, a social gathering, and I went to John and said, John, the Sabbath is coming, and I want to honor my Creator. Can you take me back home? He said, yes. He took me in the car and took me back home. I had to throw that in. But anyway, and, and also, you know, there was a gathering, so there was some drinking that was going on, and I didn't participate in any of that. On the last day, he was taking me to the airport. Uh, I was about to get out of the car, and he says to me, give me one second. I just want to say something to you. You know my brother? He, uh, I won't say with faith, he says he's a pastor. He smokes, he drinks, he curses, and he tells me I need Jesus. And I said to him, well, you look different than me. Why would I want what you have? Oh. But he looked at me and he says, but you're different. You actually try to do what the book says. 
The world isn't interested in our religion, in our faith, because we're not. <laughs> but the day that we take our religion with God serious, the world is going to take it serious. Amen. It's that simple. They're not dumb. They're looking to see who those who have it's not doing anything for them. Why do they want it? But 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 it's a power. It's a powerless church. Oh, there's so much I can say here. But the power to transform comes to Jesus. Number nine. As Jesus, no, I'm going to say. <laughs> you know, when we go to Revelation 12, 17, and it says, it talks about a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We always say that's us. Dear friend, if that was true, why are we still here? It's supposed to be us. And right now, it's us externally. But it's got to be us experientially. And when that happens, we're out of here. And we'll unpack that some more. Number nine, as Jesus worked to transform me, what is my response? Luke 22, 46, or 42 says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, when God points out sin in the life, don't fight it. Don't argue. Don't excuse it. Just say it's true. Will you please help me? I don't, you know, you know when this, when this whole thing of righteous by faith clicked with me, it was in a sermon I heard by um, oh, if I can tell you the whole background to this, was more expanded. I was in, dis I was despairing. I was despairing. I didn't think God could save me. I so wanted to be good, and I couldn't be. And I didn't think that God could save someone like me. And I was living with a sermon. It was an illustration that he gave that the light bulb went on, and it had to do with the rich young ruler. And it went like this. Follow me. If you have struggled, dear sinner, like I have, hopefully you're not a practicing sinner, but if you are, if you struggle, watch. Mm -hmm. The sinner came to Jesus, the rich and ruler, because he realized something was wrong in his life. He asked God, Jesus, what is wrong? And you remember, Jesus pointed it out, that his idol was his money. He said, get rid of it and follow me. By the way, Jesus only called 12. He was the 12. What a destiny was his. How sad. And what a terrible role he would play later. But anyway, what happened then is he walks away. Right? But now let's backtrack. What if this had happened instead? What if the rich young ruler had turned to Jesus and said, It's true. I love my money more than I love you. And I don't want to give it up. Will you help me? What would Jesus have said? She'd say, Lord, it's true. Help me. Please help me, Jesus. Are you with me? When I saw that, the light bulb went on. I love to serve Jesus. And I know there are things, there have been things in my life that when the Lord revealed it to me, like in the issue of forgiveness, when somebody has really, really trashed you, and I couldn't bring myself to do it, and I said to the Lord, I know that you want me to forgive, but I can't do it. But Lord, I give you to permission to work in me to change and to bring me to the place that I can't because I can't do it right now. And so I keep coming to Jesus, and I do every study I can on forgiveness, and I watch how Jesus dealt with with sinners and people who trashed him and gave him the courage. They did worse than him. You with me? Don't give up on Jesus. Don't hide it. Don't mask it. Don't excuse it. Don't slap a soybean on it and justify it. God can't touch it. But go to him and confess it and ask him to, to, to change your life. Don't fight him. Number 10. How is this state? How much time do we have left? You can say till about 6.30. Oh, okay. I won't take that long. Don't, don't fear. Okay, number 10. <laughs> How is this state of being of, of, be of things brought about? Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. None of you. None of your friend, none of your neighbor, none of your pastor, none of your spouse, none of your mom and dad, but of God. Live for God. Study to see what pleases Him. Well, you know, this is my taste in music. No one asked. What's God's taste? What's His? You know, can I watch rape and murder on TV and actually call that entertainment? There's something wrong. It's entertainment to the Prince of Darkness. Jesus weeps. Jesus doesn't look at that. Mm. Even when he was on the cross and they were beating out of the angels in his face. Somebody makes a movie, everybody wants to have to see it. Absolutely amazing. We've got things turned around. 
And part of the problem is that we don't know what holiness is. But as we come to Jesus every day, he will begin to fine tune us. And we suddenly start becoming sensitive to comments people make, things that come out of our own mouths, what we watch. We'll start becoming the Holy Spirit. We'll start hearing. We'll start to hear. So important. Okay. And Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn of who? Mm -hmm. Of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. It's so amazing to me. Well, maybe I shouldn't use that illustration, but Ellen White says that the work is imperceptible. You know, in other words, here's the thing. Here, there will never be a time in your life that you will look at yourself and say, I've arrived. <laughs> it will never happen. If you do, you have become the overseer. Rich, increase in goods, and need of nothing. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're focused upon Jesus, you will always be aware of your unworthiness. Even after the door of probation closed and you are sealed, you're still going to feel unworthy. Because your focus is on Christ. Amen. Are you with me? And, and you know, it's amazing, but through all eternity, we'll continue to reflect him more perfectly. Mm -hmm. wow. For all eternity. <laughs> so it's the focus has to be on Christ. And as long as you're looking to Jesus, and so what will happen is this. You're always going to be in awareness. And you're, go, you're always going to be in tears, Lord. But, but you can still have assurance, because Jesus says, I'm never going to let you go. Let me share something with you. Now watch this. As you're in this process of, of going to God and asking for the Holy Spirit and going to the Word, and, and then pray. If the Lord reveals to you a sin in your life, what you do next is critically important. If you immediately confess the sin and come near with your life on God, you stay within the precincts of the sanctuary. And what was it covered with? The righteousness of Christ. You stay covered. Well, what you do next is critical. If you excuse it, you will out. But if the moment you realize God reveals to you a sin, that's part of his job. If you go to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, you remain covered. And you recommit that to Christ. And you ask the Holy Spirit to give you strength. And you read the word what he has to say about it. And you pray to God to give you victory. Are you with me? And you stay in that process. That is the sanctification process that happens on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And the change is imperceptible. And so in your life, you keep looking to Jesus, you're not looking a whole lot better. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to look worse. Yeah. You don't look better. When you start focusing on your you the that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Because you and I cannot see truth and life and righteousness without it. But what's going to happen is the people around you are going to start seeing the change. That's encouraging to come up to and say, Lord, to God in the house. There's nothing good in you and me. There's nothing of which you and I can boast. Mm -hmm. It's all Jesus. Mm -hmm. All Jesus. Okay, where am I? Number 11? So don't focus on the sin that you're having, by the way. People often focus on the sin, and it intensifies the sin. If you keep going in your mind, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, it's strengthening it. You've got to let that go and look to Jesus. Look, by beholding, we become changed. And words go quick. Number 11. In all things, what should be our mindset? Philippians 2 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so you're studying the Bible to know Christ and how Christ dealt with sinners. My favorite story is that woman that was drugged to the church, to the church naked, more than likely, because they caught her in the act. And they brought her before family and friends that she knew to have her killed. And Jesus' response. So the guys that drove her in is what blows my mind. They exposed her to everyone. And yet when he dealt with her sin, he brought her in the mm -hmm. So no one could see it, but he had now. And that's it. What dignity and respect he dealt with those scoundrels. If that was me, <laughs> that's not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus deals with the undeserving in such a dignified loving way. And to the woman, he said to her, what? Go on. What a gracious thing. Okay, number 12. To what extent must our deeds be done in reference to God's glory? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That includes my entertainment. That includes my work. It includes everything. What I'm doing to make sure it's bringing glory and honor to God. Make sure that he approves. 
Number 13, how much must we give up to become a true disciple of Jesus? Luke 14, 33, so likewise, whatsoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, cannot be my disciple. And what this is saying is that anything that stands between my soul and my Savior must be given up. You know, I don't know if you, I, I sometimes my imagination's a little wild, but I can't help but wonder the day that we finally make it, when we arrive in New Jerusalem and we walk in. Do you ever do that? Do you ever try to picture that? And as you walk in and you see that beauty, I can't help but wonder, and as we see the angels coming, the world that Jesus placed in jeopardy. You and I have no point of reference. When we talk about giving up, giving up, what did Jesus give up? What did Jesus risk? Do you realize that for all eternity you're going to be beautiful? <laughs> no deformity. And he will have scars. He will be in human flesh forever. What he gave up to save you. And we complain about what we have to give up. He only asks us to give up that which will destroy us. He gave up everything good to save you. Oh, wow. That's true. That is a, what an amazing Savior. And when he looks at those scars, he calls them his glory. Mm. It is with joy because that's the price he had to pay for you to be with him. He was willing to pay. That is our Savior. We have to be willing to give up everything. We go to him and ask him to help us. Number 14, if we thus follow Jesus, how will Satan respond? John 14, 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. You know, at the very end, the devil is raw, but not the world, with only a small group. It is described as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the only group he hates. He doesn't hate everybody. Let me tell you, I don't want a happy devil on my case. I want one that's, that hates me.